Okay, uh, welcome to this uh, FIA climate briefing on the topic of uh, climate security uh, during times of war. Uh, my name is Emma Hakala. I'm a leading researcher uh, here at FIA, uh, and I will be chairing this uh, briefing. Uh, and we have an excellent speaker with us, with uh, Janani Vivekananda from Adelphi. Uh, I'll present her in, in more detail uh, in a moment. Uh, but uh, while people are still coming in, maybe just a few words about what uh, what we intend to talk about today. So uh, it has been quite established in the recent years, maybe in the past uh, decade even, that uh, climate change is uh, a security threat. Uh, and it has been noted by several key security actors like NATO, uh, the US military, and so on. Um, but, uh, and it, it's also quite clear that uh, climate change uh, affects these sort of um, uh, interlinked crises and it's linked to the security situation uh, overall. Uh, so now, uh, in the in a moment where we have uh, sort of the return of uh, traditional security issues on the agenda uh, with war, uh, the Russian war of attack in Ukraine, uh, also a war in in Gaza uh, and elsewhere in the world, uh, it's maybe good to ask what actually happens to this uh, climate security agenda, uh, as uh, perhaps. Traditionally, we tend to think that uh, these uh, war wartime issues and uh, defense and also uh, rearmament uh, kind of goes uh, goes beyond or has to go uh, first, uh, and then climate action maybe uh, would somehow uh, take second place. But in fact, uh, at the moment, we have a situation where we really need to uh, prepare for this uh, war on the one hand, but then still very much uh, to climate change and the environmental crisis at the same same time. So this then poses various new problems and issues for the climate security agenda. Uh, and for that, I couldn't think of a, spe a better speaker to join us than Janani. Uh, she's the head of program uh, on climate diplomacy and security at Adelphi, uh, and she specializes in climate change and peace building. And she has worked as a field researcher, practitioner, and policy advisor uh, for over 18 years in various regions of the world. Uh, has a long, long background on on these topics, uh, and I'm sure that she can share with us very. Uh, good examples of the work of Adelphi and maybe also some thoughts uh, in this changing security si situation. Um, and uh, yes, maybe at this point I'll already say to the audience um, that you are very welcome to write uh, questions in the chat and I'll then <laughs> later in the discussion part uh, post them to uh, Janani. So please already think of questions if you have any. But now I'll give the floor to Janani to give us an introduction. Uh, so please go ahead and thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Emma, and good morning, everyone. Uh, really delighted to be here. And thank you so much for putting this topic on the agenda for the discussion. I think it's an incredibly timely uh, and important one. Um, is it possible to share my slides? I don't know if you guys can see them already. No, cool. Next, next slide. Thank you, Felix. So, when I first started working on this issue about 18 years ago, climate change was very much seen as a topic for the environmental agenda. It was, you know, really kind of on the in the left field for the kind of for the for the Green Party, for the environmental um, uh, activists and environmental NGOs. But finally, things are really changing and quite rapidly. So. Um, Climate change's centrality to the peace and stability space is increasingly recognized. It's going to be a central theme at this year's NATO summit. It was the subject of numerous UN Security Council discussions um, last year and even into this year. So we we can see that we really can't be thinking about the the kind of the poly crises that the world is facing at the moment, the crises in 
uh, the, the Russian aggression in the Ukraine, the, the conflict in Gaza, the conflict in Sudan, the conflict in Myanmar, we can't really think about those in isolation, just as security risks. We've got, we, we can see when we uh, do a, a comprehensive conflict analysis that, um, that there are so many linked factors um, and one of them is um, environmental and climate change. Not that climate is a root cause uh, or, or a direct causal link, uh, has a direct causal link with the um, triggering of these conflicts, but rather it is part of the context and it has to be considered in part of the, the solution. Um, when we think about the confluence of climate change and conflicts, we know that, I, I wanted to share this, this visual, um, we know that climate change is global in its reach and it affects all of us. Um, but we have to re remember that it doesn't affect all of us equally. If we look not at the impact of climate change, but people's vulnerability to these impacts, if we rank the most vulnerable countries and we took the top quartile of countries most affected by or most uh, vulnerable to climate change, 70% of these countries were also in the top quartile of most fragile states. Next slide, please. Here's another view. So if we look at the countries receiving peace building funding, here I'm using UN peace building funding as a very loose proxy for fragility. We can see that the majority of these countries uh, that are colored in from red to green, uh, red obviously being the most sensitive, we can see that the majority of these countries receiving peace building funding are highly sensitive to climate change. So this the, this slide is thus mapping climate vulnerability of countries facing conflict, fragility, political instability, uh, alongside their vulnerability to climate change, and almost all are highly vulnerable to both. I chose this metric of financing um, because we're in a world where um, there is, you know, re um, th there's going to be less, there's more and more crises, and there is less and less financing. So if we follow the money and we want to look at how to ensure investments in peace are uh, sustainable are actually giving us value for money we basically we literally can't afford to ignore climate in peace building interventions because it's so much a part of the problem it's part of the context in these countries as you can see if you just look at that um, sub-saharan belt across you know west uh, to east africa um, it's it's such a part of the context that ignoring this would be would not make for a sustainable investment in in peace and stability. Next slide, thank you. So um, you can click twice on this one. Thank you. Thank you. So the projected impacts of climate change include things like more intense and longer droughts, more frequent wildfires, significant sea level rise, uh, increased variability and unpredictability of rainfall um, in the short run and then kind of uh, redu reductions in, in rainfall in the longer run in certain parts of the world. These are the, the kind of geophysical impacts of climate change, but these aren't happening um, in isolation. These global, these, this is kind of one of a number of global pressures which are increasing alongside things like man-made environmental degradation, urbanization, unequal economic development and inequality, population growth, um, and increasing demand on resources as um, populations uh, uh, gentrify and, and we get a growing middle class. So uh, we need to understand how climate interacts with all of these other global pressures and then how these pressures interact with pre-existing social, political and economic tensions in any given context. Um, and as climate change worsens, it interacts with these, these existing tensions and it poses risks to national and regional security. So based on these interactions, whilst all of the impacts of climate change on peace and security are incredibly context specific and affect different kind of groups within a specific geography in different ways, uh, I'll just set out a few pathways that we've been able to identify in the work that we've done and in a broader literature review over the kind of the past 10, 15 years, which give us some some ways of kind of making tangible some of these um, 
different ways that climate affects peace and security. And then I'd like to just touch on a couple of the questions that Emma started us off with in terms of what can we do to ensure that um, in this quite troubled multilateral system, we can we can find a space for climate diplomacy um, and and make sure we don't lose sight of um, the impacts of climate change alongside the other the, the other kind of global crises that seem to be more urgent and more immediate. Um, and then how can we ensure that climate is uh, remains a priority for political actors and um, and how financing is distributed. Next slide, thank you. So just quickly through a couple of these insights so we can get a, a grasp, a kind of a, a, a grasp of how climate is affecting uh, peace and security in, in real world context. So one pathway is that climate change affects competition over con uh, and, and conflicts over natural resources such as land, water and forest. So impacts such as drought and more intense rainfall and um, increased um, temperature can alter access to an availability of land, water and food, all of which are, of course, very sensitive to these changes in uh, temperature and rainfall. And this can fuel competition and can contribute to violence if and only if the natural resource and conflict management institutions in a particular setting are dysfunctional, if they're not able to equitably cope with these changes that climate change is compounding. So I'd like to stress that it's not about shortage of a resource per se, because climate change will create um, maybe an abundance of water as glacial um, uh, lakes melt more rapidly in the Himalayas, for example, there's going to be an, uh, an excess of water. It will, may also create shortages of water as you know, parts of the Sahel are experiencing um, uh, three uh, failed rainy seasons and, and a prolonged drought. But it's not about the shortage or the excess, but it's about where changes in climate affect access to a resource, which may have already been inequitable, and where there are no longer effective dispute resolution mechanisms to deal with a resource um, conflict without violence. Next slide, thank you. So another of the pathways linked to uh, the, the first one is how climate change can then affect um, livelihoods, particularly livelihoods which are dependent on natural resources such as land um, and water, so agrarian livelihoods, pastoralism, fishing, um, uh, and, and predominantly in, in countries which have a, a, an economy which is based on the primary sector. And this, as people's livelihoods are affected, is affecting human mobility. More people might choose to move as a, an adaptive strategy, either within their country, often from rural to urban settings, sometimes across borders, but usually to neighboring states. Rarely is this um, kind of from, say, sub-Saharan Africa into Europe or from North America into um, Central and South America. This is much uh, less of a pattern. Most my mobility is internal and mostly internally it's from rural settings to kind of urban second cities, for example. And where people move and they aren't able to find viable alternative livelihoods, this can then push people into illegal coping me mechanisms, things like um, criminality, uh, armed, joining armed op opposition groups, sex work for both men and women. Um, so we, we see this in terms of, you know, people look, moving into drug production, farmers moving into drug pr production in Afghanistan, illegal charcoal production um, in Somalia, and small scale and um, artisanal gold mining, which which also has a hugely adverse environmental impact in, in Sudan. Next slide, thank you. So the third pathway is how climate change can contribute to extreme food price spikes and food insecurity. Perhaps the most well-documented examples of climate-related violence is linked to food insecurity. Uh, and this was highlighted by the food riots that we saw around the world between, say, 2007 and 2011 related to food prices. And this was because we saw declining rural incomes um, due to um, due to, to climate stress in part, um, as well as a reduction in global food supply because of a reduction in 
production due to two um, coinciding droughts in both Russia and China, um, two, two big global wheat producers. And this affected poverty and increased vulnerability, uh, particularly in the regions most dependent on agriculture, so most of Sub-Saharan Africa, the Horn of Africa, and Middle East and North Africa. Um, and also particularly in countries that are dependent on imports, food imports, um, given that they just didn't have enough uh, foreign um, capital to, to be able to, to pay for these imports. Places like the MENA region are already uh, importing more than 50% of their food and they're going to require increasing foreign exchange to meet growing demand. Um, so this makes them especially sensitive to food price spices. Um, particularly when this is uh, these these shocks happen alongside kind of inequitable government government policies and a lack of kind of government social safety nets, um, such as you know the removal of food subsidies and the lack of kind of um, social services and and um, state welfare provisions for those who are facing hunger. Next slide, thank you. Um, and then the fourth pathway is around some of the sudden shocks. So many of the, the pathways I've talked about are, um, are linked to some of the slow onset changes, but sudden shocks can, sudden shocks such as extreme weather events, um, a, a flood um, or a typhoon or a storm surge can um, pose a very immediate challenge to government because it's, uh, it shows in a very kind of direct way whether or not a government is able to fulfill its basic role, its primary role, which is safeguarding the physical security of its citizens. And uh, if, you know, post-disaster, they're not seen to be able to um, provide effective uh, disaster response um, and support to affected communities, if they don't rise to the challenge of the um, weather event, this can undermine their legitimacy. We saw this with um, the government response to forest fires in Lebanon in 2019 and in recent water shortages in Iraq, Iran and Algeria. And this can really contribute to political instability and even government failure um, um, because it, this kind of the, the government's failure to deal with environmental stress can, can um, be, can trigger uh, violence, it can trigger potentially revolutionary protests. It can be kind of harnessed by opposition parties or, or non-state groups to, um, to fuel grievances against the government. The flip side of this is also that it can be uh, a very legitimizing factor when a government or an or a entity, maybe a non-state entity, is able to um, respond to these kind of shocks in a way that is seen to be um, good and effective. So we're seeing a lot of armed opposition groups um, in uh, in the Lake Chad region, for example, offering um, kind of loans and and support and food aid for those who are experiencing climate distress um, in the absence of government. Uh, service provision and this is really having a, a positive effect in terms of winning the hearts and minds of communities so this is a, a really challenging thing for, for international and national stabilization forces because this is not a kind of um, something that they can beat with kinetic force this is something that uh, is um, requires uh, new strategies in terms of kind of soft security approaches uh, which is not within the, the traditional mandate of some of the security actors, uh, the state security actors in the region. Next slide, please. And then the final um, pathway that I wanted to talk about is how not simply the climate impacts, but the unintended climate, uh, it's, sorry, the unintended consequences of our policies, our responses to either climate change or security risks can carry their own challenges. Um, climate change policies um, can, if they don't take account of, uh, of peace and security dynamics, can inadvertently do harm to you know, local power dynamics or um, the political economy, uh, because of course any, any intervention will change um, power uh, in any given context. And often these climate responses can go in 
as quite technical responses without a, a solid understanding of the conflict um, dynamics in terms of the actors and the relations um, and you know their, their relationship with um, things like natural resources. So of course, creating greater access to, to water such as drilling a borehole in one context to give um, you know, pastoralists a more reliable water source can of course create tensions if it's uh, giving that res uh, better access to water to one um, tribal pastoralist group over another. And similarly, um, peace and security and stabilization efforts where they're not taking account of climate and people's ability to cope with climate and environmental uh, risks and it can inadvertently undermine people's adaptive capacity, their ability to cope with climate risks, and this can also be um, be very harmful. Um, again, going back to Lake Chad, um, I can share an example of how military strategies um, by the international and the multinational joint task force in the region um, were so focused on um, kind of stabilizing or, or um, neutralizing the enemy, uh, the armed opposition groups, they were adopting strategies such as scorched earth tactics, they were blocking livelihoods and um, access to markets because they felt that these livelihoods such as fishing and growing certain crops were funding uh, armed groups. But in fact, you know, whilst this could have been partly the case, they were also depriving local farmers of their climate coping mechanisms. You know, farmers would turn to fishing if the rains were late. Um, they would grow red pepper if they were if, if it was too hot to plant cereal crops, for example. So the kind of forcible banning of these livelihood options and the burning of their uh, of of land um, uh, created a lot of resentment and uh, spurred aggrieved farmers to join uh, some of the armed groups in revenge, because, partly because they had no alternative livelihood because their livelihoods had been decimated by the security response, um, but also because they felt so so angry uh, at the state that they wanted to get revenge, seek revenge on the state. So the responses uh, that the impact of the security responses to in fact safeguard these communities was causing them to join the the kind of the very oppressor that the the, the, the security responses were designed to help them against. So these are some of the pathways. Um, that um, through which climate change affects peace and security. So just to end, um, and then I'd love to you know open up to questions. Um, in the facing in the mount, in the face of mounting geopolitical challenges with with the the, the numerous um, crises that we're seeing, um, how can we ensure that climate um, climate security is treated as a priority. Um, I think I see there to be three spaces, and I also want to say that whilst it all seems very difficult, you know, I I don't know anybody at the moment that could say that we have a functioning multilateral system. Um, climate actually does op offer an opportunity. If I look at um, all the the multilateral spaces. And their challenges, the UN Security Council being almost um, entirely stymied because of, um, of, of the, the veto um, option and the fact that it's creating a lot of kind of um, bad feeling amongst UN member states because of how just how uh, inequitable it is um, and how um, uh, without UN reform we are still locked into kind of 20th century institutions uh, trying to deal with 21st century um, kind of power dynamics and uh, problems which you know the current system is not fit for purpose to deal with climate the climate space does provide an unusual kind of area for consent beyond normal political tensions if i look at the the climate negotiations under the un framework convention on climate change this um, just two years ago, it saw the US and China agreeing to a joint declaration, which was very unexpected. It highlighted that while the G2 won't be a driver of high ambition um, outcomes on climate change, 
these two states, US and China, they, they agreed to um, reduce um, their, their emissions um, and actually agreed to a, a specific set of, of commitments um, bilaterally, um, putting aside their, you know, their, 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 their differences on, on numerous other issues. And this was, this was interesting, you know, they weren't willing to let their existing tensions derail international negotiations. Um, on on issue on, on this issue, um, we also saw a fierce diplomatic battle between OPEC and small island champions of climate ambition, and it, it we saw the underdogs triumph. There was a at COP um, a, at COP twenty six, we saw a high ambition coalition led by the tiny Republic of the Marshall Islands, bolstered by Denmark, Spain, Colombia, and a couple of others, and they rallied twenty one hundred twenty seven countries. Um, including previously sceptical oil and gas and coal exporters like the UK, the US and China uh, and Canada and Australia uh, behind an overwhelming call to transition away from fossil fuels and triple um, renewable energy and increase, uh, increase energy efficiency. And this again was quite an interesting kind of um, multilateral success. Um, so I think there is scope within the climate diplomacy space to see um, to, to kind of forge out new coalitions of the willing and find spaces to move forward within our current kind of rather troubled multilateral system. And then to ensure that climate diplomacy and climate is treated as a priority amongst our current kind of geopolitical challenges, I think there are three things. Uh, we need to ensure that climate change it is integrated and mainstreamed into security policy to avoid this kind of either or um, problem. Either we deal with conflict or we deal with climate or this kind of there is always going to be a more urgency priority dynamic. You know, I, I'm constantly facing security actors who will say, oh, you know, in Yemen, first we need to deal with uh, the conflict and then we can think about climate. But actually, this this is a false um, sequencing myth. Um, if we don't think about climate whilst we're thinking about sustainable kind of political solutions and, and any kind of a peace agreement, whatever we, we reach will be unsustainable. Uh, we also need to acknowledge that green growth, economic development and regional geopolitics are inexorably interlinked. Um, they're complicated, they're path dependent and they can present obstacles to progress. But if we don't acknowledge these links, um, we will, uh, we can lock ourselves into paths forward in terms of development pathways or, or stabilization strategies that um, kind of lock us into inadvertent kind of uh, negative cycles. And then the third opportunity uh, to ensure that climate is part of how we understand and respond to these current geopolitical challenges is through dialogue and partnership. I think. The avoidance of Western centrism and the instrumentalization of climate change as a Western issue is really key to ensure that any kind of geopolitical challenges within our current, you know, whatever we're going to call it, multipolar world um, is really um, seen as equitable and that, 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 that they are fair. So we need to see kind of the EU strengthening its climate diplomacy by rapidly putting together an offer for global, the Global South that includes kind of stabilization and financing and innovative co cooperation to, to counter some of the negative reactions to the current frameworks and current regulations that are very, um, um, very much dependent on kind of what unidirectional partnerships, shall we say. So in sum, above all, I think we need to prevent climate change from becoming a um, we need to prevent climate from being a kind of geopolitical football, um, but and 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 that means we need to make sure it's it's kind of it's depoliticized within the UN Security Council within security spaces. We need to ensure that the integration of climate into peace and security isn't seen as a political issue. You know whether a kind of Western um, agenda versus the, the rest, um, but at the same time, it, and this might sound contradictory, we also need to 
make it we need to insert politics back into climate discussions and decisions and here i mean kind of small p politics i mean ensuring that security and geopolitical um dynamics and political economy considerations must be taken account in the implementation of climate change adaptation and mitigation measures to ensure that climate action doesn't do harm and can actually enhance um, peace and security and stabilization efforts. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Janani. Uh, and uh, great that uh, we didn't lose you for good there. <laughs> uh, but thank you. Uh, it was a really interesting and great presentation. I, I think a very good uh, introduction to First of all, all the various uh, concrete pathways in which uh, climate affects security. Um, and uh, I especially like that you pointed out this uh, sort of linkage uh, between uh, kind of having to have this conflict sensitive climate policy uh, and also uh, in a way climate sensitive security policy so as to avoid these future problems um, in both of these fears. So I think that's a really interesting and important point and we can talk about it more. Uh, thanks for also providing some solutions and some maybe steps forward um, where we can uh, approach these issues. Um, but I will allow, of course, audience questions as well, uh, but maybe first I will take the opportunity to uh, ask some questions myself. Mm, so I thought to start off with just what is your take at the moment? Uh, what is the situation in terms of um, how seriously, in a way, climate security is taken as a security uh, issue? I mean, has there been some kind of a sort of backlash uh, uh, in terms of um, its integration to the security sphere now with this uh, kind of uh, re-emergence of these traditional security? problems what, what do you think um thanks emma that's that's a great question i think if we look at something if we look at the un security council that gives us one message so you know climate change was brought to the security council for the very first time in 2007 um in a discussion from by the uk and this was quite kind of groundbreaking because it was the very first time that climate was seen as a kind of security issue. There was some uh, significant pushback, but there's been progress again over, you know, many years. But we have since um, the past, um, say, three or four years, uh, seen increasing kind of politicization and pushback with Russia in particular and China um, and some of the other elected members. Um, really um, pushing back on climate be being um, integrated into mandates. Initially, we felt we saw we could see that um, there wasn't much of a challenge to put it into specific kind of geographical mandates of political and peacekeeping missions. We we see kind of uh, maybe I've lost the number now in, in my head, but um, I can share like the list of all the uh, Security Council resolutions that have um, some good language on climate, and this has been quite a a, a significant um, step. But, but at the moment, uh, since the past two years, we're seeing this language being rolled back, and it's a real challenge uh, to keep the language on, you know, how mandates should, at the very least, include um, a, a risk assessment and, you know, include management efforts to take account of the, the impacts of climate change on peace and security in specific contexts like Mali in the MINUSMA mandate, in Lake Chad, in um, in the UNAWAS mandate, for example. But this, this is the UNAWAS mandate is in uh, for uh, West Africa and the Sahel is coming up for renewal and just speaking to some um, um, UN partners who are trying to, you know, within the Security Council who are really trying to keep the language in there, which which is quite good. Uh, they're really afraid that this is going to be rolled back. So it's it's there within the UN Security Council space. Uh, there's there's real pushback, but this is very much just on the political 
um, level. This is just seen as um, it's become a kind of totemic issue, nothing to do with climate change really, but rather a way of kind of pushing back against the um, the West by by Russia wielding its veto. The the Irish and Niger um, put forward a, a global resolution on climate change and security, which had um, the largest number of co-sponsors of, of nearly any, I think it was the second largest number of co-sponsors of any UN resolution, uh, but it was vetoed by by Russia. So it just shows that it is, this is, this is um, now a politicized issue in the UN Security Council space, but then if we look beyond that, because this isn't really where security happens, right, in the, in the Security Council, this is just where um, kind of geopolitics happens, but we can see at more of an operational level, it is being um, taken more seriously. If I look at, uh, say, like the UN Peacebuilding Fund, they did a really interesting review of their work, and it's really starting to integrate um, climate into peacebuilding op operations. They're piloting some of the most interesting kind of peacebuilding work, which is using climate as an entry point and climate uh, um, and integrating and trying to find ways that climate change um, kind of impacts can be uh, uh, can be minimized and you know resilience can be built through peace building um, and as we were just talking earlier Emma we can see also how in a lot of institutions within the EU within NATO within kind of national governments bilateral kind of um, uh, stabilization efforts there is this recognition and there's policies. The US has a climate security strategy. Um, Germany's developing a climate security strategy. The UK is developing a climate security strategy, which would be kind of cross-governmental. It would be to to integrate climate security across, you know, their foreign policy and their defense as well as their development work. So we are seeing this um, being taken seriously. But I think the challenge at the moment is um, how to operationalize it. So it's happening at the policy level and there's the conceptual kind of buy-in, but we're not quite seeing, apart from in small pockets, uh, largely driven by kind of individuals rather than anything institutionalized, um, the work to operationalize this on the ground. So we have a few projects um, and a few organizations that are doing this. Um, such as the peace building fund, but we're not really seeing. Um, well, this is a space to be growing, and I think the 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 COP, uh, the UAE COP um, declaration on relief, recovery, and peace was was a useful kind of catalyst here because it was the very first time that this was part of any kind of a climate space COP negotiation. It's not part of the official negotiations, nor is it a, an official COP, UNFCCC outcome, but rather just a side declaration, but it does show the political buy-in to link peace to climate action. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Janani, uh, we can't see your face at the moment, so could you switch on oh. your camera? <laughs> oh, I see, so let's see. Um, people won't have to look at only me. <laughs> uh, I do have some more questions myself but there are some really good questions in the chat so maybe let's go there um do you, do you see it now do you see me uh, now no unfortunately not still um so but if it's uh if it's not so working, i see then... my face and okay. I've got me... <laughs> but i told you i've got a strange i think since it cut out i've got a strange um well oh now we see you Great. oh you see me oh okay yes. i just turned it off and turned it on again okay okay sometimes oh, there we go okay thank you uh yes let's go to the questions in the chat so there is one from mikko halonen on the so costs and benefits uh including peace dividends uh in proactively addressing climate security and other environmental threats mm -hmm. um so how do you think that the uh, being able to highlight these cost and benefit issues would help to mainstream climate and environmental concerns uh, more uh, more broadly 
Yeah, I think hugely. And I think this is something that we really need to be working on. And it's it's very difficult because it's very hard to cost because you're also trying to put a price on a counterfactual because you're showing uh, resilience to something that hopefully won't happen. Um, and you, you can't really, it's a bit like showing the, the benefit of peace. You don't have the counterfactual. You don't, you can't kind of hope for the conflict to be able to to show, uh, or in this case, hope for the, the climate disaster, um, to show the, um, the, the impact of something. But yeah, this is where we need to get better at um, the M&E of this. We need to get better at integrating um, kind of the impact of, say, climate, of, of peace building, if we're just looking at peace and, and stabilization efforts, um, the impact of these interventions on, uh, say, climate resilience and, and um, um, positive and negative impacts on um, people's adaptive capacity. And then somehow the first step is to get better at knowing how to measure this because adapt adapt adaptation and resilience is so intangible. It can be so broad and very, you know, a battle that I'm constantly fighting is to explain that it's not going to be very kind of directly linked to climate change. It's going to look like things like um, stronger trust between communities and uh, strengthening social cohesion and more effective institutions that can support um, people in, in equitable ways rather than giving people drought resistant seeds to, to cope with um, increased temperatures. You know, the, when we look at a very local level, what makes people resilient to climate change, they're often the same kind of things that make people resilient to peace. So it's kind of hard to to, to measure it, um, but it is possible. But it, we've got a lot of kind of um, pushing to do there because those who are doing the peace building uh, or climate adaptation work aren't including these into their M&E frameworks. They're not including, or they just don't know what indicators to use. So we're actually trying to do a, a quite a bit of work um, on a kind of pilot project, we have a project called Weathering Risk, the Peace Pillar, um, to actually look at what the, the, the indicators would be across a range of five uh, peace building projects, uh, put those baselines in place, and then start to measure them over the course of the peace building intervention um, to show those costs and benefits. And then, to, to, and then the second step is to cost it, because I think we really do need a business case because when we go to say the, the stabilization unit, and this is what we were asked to do, this is funded from the German stabilization unit, they want this project to show why the German government then, or if and why they, they should then integrate climate security into all of its stabilization work, like what's the business case? What, what, how can we show that this makes their stabilization efforts more impactful and you know better value for money? Why is it worth that extra? investment so absolutely i think we need to do this and the first step is getting better at actually measuring the impact and then costing it costing is always very difficult and it will be a, a flawed you know we can never put a price on um the cost of um conflict because it's it's so amorphous but um i think this is what we do need to do to make the case um at a political level Yes, thank you. Thank you. That's really interesting. Uh, perhaps slightly related, another question from Kari Kankampa. He asks, how do you see the role of the private sector in addressing climate security? Um, so there is, um, <laughs> there's um, private sector engagement in all of these contexts. So in in exactly the same way in terms of kind of conflict sensitivity and um, climate sensitivity, uh, I would see that at the very least, um, private sector actors in these fragile contexts should be taking account, you know, in integrating um, conflict and climate se sensitivity into their work. So taking something like conflict sensitive business practices and including the kind of the, cl the climate um, component. A lot of the, the well, some of the um, 
the work happening in this space is is around extractive it, the extractive industries and they're they're very aware I, I don't think that any of these private sector actors are going to do this out of any kind of moral um considerations but they also have a strong business case because if uh their work is environmentally unsustainable one it's going to increase the risk of conflict and two their investments will be unsustainable you know if you're if it's coca-cola building a, they, they they produce at site they actually kind of they, they, they have uh shorter supply chains because most of the time they um they're actually producing in in situ which means they need access to water and a lot of the kind of resources that go in and if they are built and so they actually have uh an interesting kind of community consultation process because if they are that you know they can easily secure with the national government really good access to water rights because they can pay the government but of course this can then create huge tensions at the community level because the community will go and burn down their um their warehouses because they're very angry because coca-cola has their the the, the um, access to the deep water boreholes so they realize that they have to include kind of community um uh, benefit sharing mechanisms into their business practices it's not perfect but you know they know that they need to do this or they can't they can't continue production or the costs of security um on private security are so high that it's it, it, it and and the disruptions to production are, are high uh so they they see that this is a kind of this is a cheaper way of ensuring that they can um continue production uh another part of this i think is ensuring that um you know with, with the the green transition and the uh, this is very much kind of corporately led how to ensure that we again think about peace and security in this as a real really strong risk that we think of this as just you know an unalloyed good and we think oh you know let's just make this transition um and think about the climate benefits and how this is you know reducing our ghg emissions but of course it's creating new winners and losers um and if we don't consider those um kind of political economy shifts in this this is uh, uh, problematic so i think this is partly the role of the private sector, but partly regulations, so partly it's going to be around kind of voluntary principles. If there's um, an understanding of how this the conflict sensitivity needs to be brought into um, the green transition. And just to give an example, like if we take the example of um, say um, critical minerals, you know, we know that we need to uh, produce more um, battery powered kind of EVs, for example, and the mining of these, of, of lithium and cobalt and all the, the minerals that are needed for electric vehicles and uh, a lot of the um, transitional energy, renewable energy sources are taking place in poorly governed um, contexts and um, can have a really uh, adverse impact on peace and security in these communities. So how do we ensure that this is done in a conflict sensitive way? Um, this is partly the role of the private sector to, to do this in the perhaps in the same way that they did this with um, the mining of minerals uh, of, of diamonds, for example, the voluntary principles around um, like the Kimberley or oh, well, uh, around extractives, but also uh, with diamonds, it was the Kimberley process, which was um, an international kind of non-binding, but it was an international process um, through um, government agreements as well as uh, the private sector so i think there are some spaces there and also we have to acknowledge through the kind of government um and the kind of public private partnerships around renewable um energy development such as solar and hydro um, power that they they are t they tend to be um led by private sectors but with a lot of public sector money and again we don't see much at the moment don't see any um conflict sensitivity going into this and of course um something like a a large solar um, plant is going to need a lot of it needs a lot of land and often this is a uh, land which has um it, it can be common land where there are no land rights but this land is often used uh through customary rights by 
by, by pastoralists or by communities to graze uh, small scale livestock. So this is um, it, it, these things need to be considered, particularly when we see kind of countries like um, the Gulf states just buying up tracts of land in sub-Saharan Africa to, to, to do a lot of this kind of um, energy production. But also it, uh, something like solar, it does re require a lot of water as well to, to cool solar panels. So again, it's considering how to ensure conflict sensitivity of these um, large scale climate act acts. So, on the one hand, it's it, it's private sector, but it's also often these are kind of through large um, kind of public bodies or or through um, loans. So it's something that the private sector could, should consider, but it's also something like some of the donors, such as the World Bank, should be putting this into um, the the requirements when they grant these loans. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Perhaps something where the public sector and private sector have to kind of also coordinate and work together. Um, there is also a really interesting question from, or a kind of a reflection from Anne Heinola, uh, something that I was also thinking about. Um, she is pointing out um, kind of how the peace and security sector is taking uh, climate into account in its own actions. Uh, so, of course, climate is becoming an issue, for example, in conflict analysis. But uh, still, perhaps the peace and security sector does not necessarily assess its own actions adequately. Uh, and as Anne says, anything can be done in the name of security. So what is what is your take on that? Um, yeah, I would agree. I think there are some small scale projects which look at, um, I, I mentioned the Peace Building Fund because I, I really haven't come across many other projects, um, but they uh, there, there are some pilots there which actively, or just act, actual projects which actively look at um, how to, in the design as well as the implementation, ensure kind of um, peace building is also enhancing climate resilience. But otherwise, it's uh, I, I, it's that challenge of the sequencing that I I, I feel is the the obstacle that you know there's this you know first we need to do peace and then we can consider climate and environment uh, and it makes it very difficult to integrate or to convince um, uh, peace building actors or the security sector to integrate this at the time we see there's language in peacekeeping mandates within the UN uh, Security Council um, kind of um, countries. Um, but there's not, I, I haven't seen much operationalization of this, partly because people just don't know how to do it, uh, it within the missions. Um, same with NATO missions. Um, so yeah, I would agree with Anne's point. And I think um, something that we're trying to do is to at least get, so with the UK government, for example, try to ensure that the new this new stabilization fund that they're designing does integrate um, climate in its assessments of its um, in how it measures its impact and success so it can at least even if it's not part of the objective of a peace building project or, or a stabilization project it can ensure that the way that um, it's evaluated and success is monitored. It can see not just the impact on kind of traditional peace um, indicators, but also um, its impact on climate res resilience. But I think we're really at the beginning of this journey. Okay, yes. Luckily we have actors like uh, Adelphi who are assisting <laughs> this uh, peace and security sector in doing these, these things. Uh, we are nearing the end of the webinar but I actually have a question of my own, um, and I would maybe like to integrate a bit of uh, Juha Hate's question from the from the chat. Um, he points out the sort of um, uh, kind of uncertainties concerning maybe climate change scenarios of the future, but then also the socioeconomic uh, impacts, which are often very very difficult to uh, evaluate from in advance which is something that I'm dealing with very much in my own work, that it's difficult to build these sort of uh, uh, scenarios, obviously, because we can't predict the future. 
Uh, but keeping in mind that uncertainty and also the, the current uh, changing security uh, architecture in a way, uh, what do you think that uh, countries like, for example, Germany and, and Finland, which have been known, especially Germany, for its uh, climate diplomacy action, and Finland has uh, water diplomacy initiatives. Um, so what do you think should be at least taken into account? And what are some of the things that uh, that should be sort of promoted in these kinds of initiatives? Um, I think that the challenge um, is around, uh, you know, uh, uncertainty. And if we're thinking about the policy timelines, um, I mean, we, it's it's great if we can think, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, but really policymakers are not thinking beyond the next electoral cycle. So I think if we keep within kind of the three to five year or to, you know, three to 10 year timeline, um, it's very difficult as uh, as the comment is to, to have uh, scenarios which can give us anything very specific, but I think that's that's just fine because what we need to learn to deal with isn't specific climate impacts and specific climate futures, but the uncertainty, because this is what we will find. It's it's about the variability in the system and also not just within the climate system, but you know how these interactions will play out with the range of socioeconomic um, uh, and political and technological developments. We just don't know, but we do know that this is not going to be a risk in places with equitable and effective governance institutions, or it's going to be less of a risk in these institutions. It's going to be less of a, uh, a risk in, pla um, in places where there is coping capacity to deal with a range of possible futures. You know, we're not thinking about climate interventions in the Netherlands or, or climate peace and security interventions in, in the Netherlands compared with Bangladesh, even though they're facing very similar kind of climate impacts in terms of sea level um, intrusion and impact on um, um, agricultural production and uh, coastal um, uh, cities and things like this. Not So we're not really focusing on the climate hazard there, we're, we're co focusing on the vulnerability to those climate hazards. So I think um, the scenarios are very helpful, but the scenarios are not I find that the value not to kind of come up with the specific futures to then plan for, but rather to help us understand the range of possible futures and the kind of variability that we need to work with. So I, I personally struggle with a lot of these um, model based approaches, which is t which tends to be where a lot of kind of um, uh, donors like the EU and Germany and you know every EU member state pretty much has its own um, early warning system then there's an EU wide early warning system and you know these are really interesting intellectual um, models and we can kind of build in all the kind of data sets that can give us socioeconomic um, uh, data along with kind of technological um, um, a, a chance to model kind of uh, how technology is going to go, but it's all looking backwards. All of the data that we're feeding into these models are historic data uh, and, you know, the future doesn't look like the past. So we need to be ready to deal with the variability. Um, so I think scenarios are helpful, but I think that's a helpful process to help us understand how we need to be um, better at coping with uh, the kind of, or better at focusing on the no regrets solutions that enable people to to cope with a range of possible climate futures. I fear that in the search for un, for, for certainty um, and um, the, the kind of need to, the, the challenge that a lot of policymakers feel to make decisions in the face of uncertainty with imperfect information we're just kind of investing in models to just give us early warning uh, mechanisms and and um, and not really feeling able to invest in in that uncertainty. Of course, there will be risks, um, but I think that that this uh, this space requires a more risk averse um, financing space. Not risk, not to take risks of things that will in, in things that will potentially do harm, but risk that you won't get the return on investment, but you would have still, you know, invested in something that will in, reduce poverty or enhance people's, um, you know, resilience in some way. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I think we've managed to illustrate the, the gravity of the situation and also the need and, and seriousness of having to keep climate very much on the security agenda. Uh, but also we've provided now some maybe hope for the future or at least some opportunities on, on going forward. Um, so thank you very much, Janani, for this really nice talk and, and uh, uh, presentation. And thanks also to the, to the audience for good questions and participation. Thank you and thank join you. us again for the next climate briefing. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the really wonderful questions and for the opportunity. And wishing you all a good day. Thank you. Bye.